Do not attempt the techniques you are about to see without consulting a professional. So while we're waiting here for our delayed plane, I figure I'd give you a little story time. There's a horse, walked into a bar. Bartender said, hey. Horse said, sure. I'm Michael Gascon, the horse guru. I have the amazing job of traveling around the world, fixing the world's most problematic horses. We're gonna see all kinds of breeds and all kinds of horse problems. We're gonna train the untrainable, ride the unrideable, and do the impossible. Just like on uh, on Nitro Circus, man, it, it, the opening is everything. It tells you exactly what you need to see. What's going on guys? So we got the world's most awesome job. We get to travel around the world fixing all these problem horses. Now sometimes to get to these problem horses is a bit of a chore. Today, for example, we're heading up to Wells, Michigan and we have to leave from South Mississippi. So it's about an hour to get to the airport. We're here in New Orleans at the airport. Got delayed a couple hours, no big deal. We fly from here to Detroit and pick up a car. And from the car, it'll be a couple more hours to get to the ranch in Wells, Michigan. But they have some fallen ponies for us, and you know that's right up our alley. We'll see if we can get there, fix some horses, and head back to the ranch. waiting for a bus so that we can get to the rental car, just so we can get to the ranch and help these horses out. I'm Pam Anschutz. And I'm Lee Anschutz. <laughs> you didn't tell me I was gonna be I didn't know. He's half Paso, half Tennessee Walker. Now, I just want to make him the perfect trail horse that he actually is going yeah. to ride. And he's not, you know, he hasn't been re riding that long, and I just want to be, feel secure that he's going to be the good boy. He's going to be the husband horse. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly You got right. it, absolutely right. <laughs> he was a 10-year-old walker cross that came in, just absolutely beautiful. Uh, Palomino just shined nice and fat and just looked awesome. The problem with De Niro is he was a bit flighty. He had run through some fences, he had run away with a few people, he had put a few people on the ground, and after dumping his owner, she was a little bit hesitant about riding him. And she wanted to make sure that he was gonna be safe for his owner. So whenever they came to me, they thought his problem was is that he was spooky. Once we worked with him a little bit, we figured out that spookiness wasn't his problem. All right, guys. So the first thing we're gonna do is start in kindergarten. We're just gonna walk off. Guys, we're gonna back up a little easier. So sometimes, whenever you add the pressure to the horse, they're gonna try to flee by moving right or left. Keep both eyes and both ears with you. So right here, you see how I'm getting one eye? I need both eyes, I need it to be centered. I need, it, I need him to be able to handle taking pressure. A hot horse, I need them to be able for me to put my leg on them. Uh, a, a cold horse, I need them to be able to handle putting pressure to get them to move. If they can't handle pressure and they can't even look at you, that's the same horse that if you kick them, they're not going to be able to handle themselves. There we go. Whenever you think kindergarten, I just want you to think respect. 
Perfect. He passed kindergarten. We'll move on to first grade. I'm going to put the coils in my lead hand here. Do you see what I mean about the pressure? The same horse that doesn't back easy and listen, whenever I pop pressure just to move his shoulders over a little bit, he just tries to take off and drag, right? I would really like for him to do this. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Move my shoulder? Okay. I don't want just because I put a little pressure that they think it's flight. So he's run into my hand a couple times. So now he's second guessing running off. After we were able to show him that we're the alpha and he's the beta, show him that we're in charge, that we're the leader and he's the follower, once we were able to establish this, we were able to gain control of his head. Do, 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 do. So we're gonna call him Harold. Harold? Harold the husband horse. <laughs> or Harry. Harry the husband horse. So look, for notice how the same horses that have problems, do you see how there's no surprises? The same horse that had calm but has a difficulty backing out of your space, he also has a difficulty dropping his head and being submissive. He has a difficulty giving the pressure. I imagine he won't be too difficult desensitizing if I was to guess. So you have a broke horse, a horse that's so calm that you're willing to give your, your soulmate, okay? But even though he's calm, maybe she has an insurance policy on you, I don't know. Uh, even, even though she's, he's calm, he's not used to giving the pressure, which is very, very normal. A lot of times when horses are calm, a great horse will ruin your horsemanship. I say again, a great horse will ruin you because you have no reason to worry. Put your guards up, be defensive, be thinking ahead, be the leader, because they do everything for you. So a lot of times when I get a calm, easy horse that anybody can ride, they don't get the pressure because people hasn't, haven't been doing any homework in so long, they just get on and go, get on and go, that the horse doesn't know how to give. Well, I've seen you on the internet and I've always been intrigued with you and wanted to do this. And when I saw that Christine was having you up there, I just, I snapped, as soon as I saw it, I, I jumped in on it because I couldn't wait. And I was gonna, I said that was it. Well, look here. If the husband is the one that gets bucked off, that's not necessarily a bad mark on the horse, okay? That doesn't count. If your husband's a horse trainer and he gets bucked off, that's something. But if he's the husband horse and the husband comes off, I'm not ready to condemn the horse yet. They're gonna have to show me more than that. His ability to be able to control his head was his issue. So we spent our whole time working with De Niro, making sure that we had full control of his head. Control the head, control the horse. So he's a husband horse understandable so you get your husband a volvo great he's safe in the volvo even though it's a volvo it still needs a steering wheel right i don't care how slow or quiet or calm your horse is there's no amount of brokenness that allows it to be okay not to have a steering wheel so that's just what we're working on now again it doesn't make him a good horse a bad horse not a husband horse it's just something that we need to point out we need to get that softer and easier once we were able to break through the resistance that he had in his head, it's basically like getting the steering wheel freed up and putting power steering fluid in him. Once we got the power steering fluid in, he became very easy to handle, very easy to manage, and we were able to do things that they thought was impossible.
There we go. So, notice I touched those back legs, I touched those flanks. It's for a reason. I want to see who he is. So I grab his flanks, I touch his undercarriage, his undesirable places, um, because I want him to get uncomfortable and show me who he is exactly. Now I want him to move. All right. Remember desensitizing at a standstill? It's just a concept. Now knowing that, I also saw something else. I also saw that there is, there's no crazy there. When things are uncomfortable for him, he wants to give. Right there, I just hold. Too done. So I saw a horse that when I started putting pressure on him, he didn't want to keep that pressure on him. He wanted to find a way out. So even though he's very stiff in the head, I know that I'm going to be able to make progress in the saddle because I see a horse that is willing to at least conversate. See right there? The first time he really threw his head up. Now you got to remember, uh, a lot of times, and, and this is again, not a breed thing, it is a condition thing, but a lot of times for the bigger, for your bigger gated horses, they're straight line track horses, like Tennessee walkers and racking horses and horses that straight line, Icelandics. Well, since they, they're trained to go on a straight line, they're not very soft left and right. So they're good as long as they're on a track. But then as soon as they come and you're trying to go on in the real world and life happens, you realize, oh, it's like a dragster. You get one of those funny car dragsters, well, they're not worth a dang if you try to race NASCAR with it because they don't steer, right? Oh, yeah, he grunts a lot. There we go. He only grunts because he doesn't give. If he gave, he'll stop grunting. Oh. So like that, of course, he grunts because it's a lot of pressure. Doo -doo, doo -doo. There we go, he's starting to get softer. So I switch to this side, look, I lead with my eyes. I wanna see whenever I switch my eyes from one side to the other, you see how his head's already going in that direction? He's not dumb, he doesn't want that pressure. I mean, he's blonde for sure, but he's not dumb in your head start from the outside work your way in work your way in whenever it gets calm and quiet walking grab with your second hand now whenever he stops boom stop and release horse immediately wants to go forward again other side notice he wants the buck he wants to do a lot of things, but there's nobody here to fight with. My hands are free. What's gonna start happening is I'm gonna start touching and releasing. Start touching and releasing. Start touching and releasing. Right, he doesn't like to give.
But guess what? When they start backing, then they start giving. Backing is submission. Backing is a very unnatural motion for a horse. There we go. So I started, that time I was pulsating, he threw his head way up in the air, and I just kept pulsating until he gave me the right answer. But look at, look at the bend we're starting to get in that horse, and look at the pressure that we're putting to get that bend. I mean, that's what we're trying to get. Oh. Well, dang it, Steve. I told you that model, it doesn't back the transmission. It's ruined in it. You know, they got to change to that other. They, they need that, that Allison transmission. That's not how horses work. These horses, oh, he doesn't like the back. I don't care if you like it or not. This is not a, this is not a democracy. There we go. All right, so we have a runaway horse. What's one of the things that we can do to give him the opportunity to run away? Now out of nowhere, excuse me. When it came to playing soccer or putting a tarp on his back from the saddle or standing up on his back and waving a tarp, we were able to do things that they just thought were just mind blowing. And it was as simple as this, control the head, control the horse. They weren't able to control his head, so anytime that he got spooked or nervous or barn sour, he would just lock up that steering wheel and take control. Since we were able to take that out of him and get him a lot more submissive, uh, a lot more disciplined, we were able to get him to do anything and everything we asked. And we were able to get that nice, calm, quiet husband horse that we're looking for. Had a great time. You helped a whole lot. I was really impressed. And I, uh, the difference in all the horses, including my own, was uh, and very impressive. And well, I'm going to go home and practice. <laughs> well, thank you. That, that, that's so awesome to see. It's always fun to get to work the husband horses. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, the husband horses are usually the horse that the wife dubs easy and then gives to the horse. A lot of times the, the easy horse is not always so easy. So we just went through and checked all the buttons and made sure that he was forgiving and that he was, he was uh, ready for you to ride. I'll tell you what, she was really terrified of what was going to happen today. You stood up on that horse, he didn't move. Now she's a believer. I'm okay? a believer. <laughs> absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What was your biggest aha moment? And we'll, we'll talk to you. You're an, uh, a horse person? Well, I, you know, I've ridden trail ridden for a long gotcha, time. Gotcha, okay? gotcha. And actually, i never ridden in that saddle. We have a tucker that I ride in, so that would have been a nightmare if I'd gotten <laughs> up on that saddle just to get used to the saddle. Right. But I'm really sorry I didn't do it, because right. I would have loved to kick that soccer ball around. Absolutely. After watching you do it, I know De Niro would have responded. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what was your biggest aha moment for the day? What was the thing that, you, that really took you by surprise? how quickly you were able to gain control of all of the horses. Uh, they, they responded to what you were doing that quickly and what you're doing seems to be the best way to work a horse. They, had, they respond, they respond. Well, I, I sure appreciate that. Yeah. And what, was there any aha moments for you or anything that you learned? I, I know uh, that you've been doing this for, well, for a yeah, long time. Well, yeah, it's just a give and take of the head and the, how you get them to drop their head and relax and, and mostly the hands and using your hands in the right way. Awesome, awesome. And that De Niro did not freak with a tarp she, and a ball. She thought he would freak, and he <laughs> didn't. Did. He was so good. He was good, yeah. Well, and, it, yeah. Don't, don't you find it very interesting that so many of the problems that we encounter with our horses, a lot of times, it's a symptom of the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's not the, the root of the problem. Right. As soon as we started working him, we found out that he was real stiff in his head and neck, mm -hmm. and that was what made it. It's not a horse's fear that hurts you, it's their reaction to that fear. Correct. So yep. by relieving him of his resistance in his head, then he had no opinion when it came to the tarp or the ball or the obstacles. We were able to get him to do anything that we wanted him to. Right, right. Would you guys ever come to another Gascon Horsemanship Absolutely. Clinic? Absolutely. We may be coming to Mississippi. Mississippi. We're awesome. in South Carolina half the year, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, we would, would love to have you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Thank you very it's much. It's been Thank a pleasure. Thank you very much. Mike. I sure Thank appreciate you. it, really, sir. Really All appreciate right. it. Awesome. Thanks.
Hey guys, I'm Michael Gascon, the horse guru. Today we're here in Poplarville, Mississippi at the Gascon Horsemanship Ranch. Here in South Mississippi, it's always fair weather. It's always sunny and bright. We have over a thousand acres to ride on, just trails and obstacle courses, ponds to ride the horses through. Just an amazing place to be. Everybody has their niche. We have an amazing reining trainer, amazing trick trainer. We have an amazing Fasofino trainer, and the list goes on and on. And when you come here, it's just hard not to get swept up in the environment and the peace, love, and positivity that we have here on the ranch. We have a Western hotel. We have cabins, cowboy quarters, RV spots. People come and bunk with us and learn the knowledge that we've gained over five generations of horsemen. My mother was a horse trainer. She was the second youngest woman to ever win Congress in the 80s. And she was Miss Rodeo, North Carolina. And my father was a superstar Pasofino trainer, winning national championships and world championships back to back to back. And there were always problem horses in and around. So ever since passing it down to me, I decided that I didn't want to just be a regular horse trainer. I wanted to share our knowledge, our education, our history with the world so you can communicate easier with your horse. So the big difference in the revolution that we're bringing to the horse industry is not wearing our horse out to get what we want. We use simplicity and communication to get everything that we want out of the horse. And we'll work 10 to a dozen horses a day. And not only do we work 10 to a dozen horses a day, there'll be 10 to 12 different breeds a day. And those 10 different horses are all gonna progress, all gonna play soccer, all gonna do obstacles, all gonna do things that their owners thought impossible the day before. People say, how can one person work so many different breeds? It's because we're speaking the language of the horse. If you try to make the horse learn your language, you may have success, but you're gonna to have to make every horse along the way speak your language. If you add a little pressure to yourself and you learn how to speak the language of the horse, then you can talk to any horse around the world. Stay tuned to see the rest. So the big difference in the revolution that we're bringing to the horse industry is not wearing our horse out to get what we want. We use simplicity and communication to get everything that we want out of the horse. If you try to make the horse learn your language, you may have success, but you're going to have to make every horse along the way speak your language. If you add a little pressure to yourself and you learn how to speak the language of the horse, then you can talk to any horse around the world. Anytime you get a chance, you should come down and see us. Well, my name is Adrian DeMassage, and um, we raised Morgans. We bought this stallion, or actually leased to buy him, um, about six months ago. And he was trained young, he's 10 years old, and has mostly just sat in the pasture for most of his life. And uh, we want to use him as a breeding stallion, but in order to decide to keep him, I also want him um, to be able to be competitive. I want to do endurance and cowboy dressage. So the main goal that I would like to see is to get a little more attention and respect here okay. and um, be able to work publicly with them. Okay, perfect. Well, I'll take that if you want to go get a seat. Yep. So I think this clinic is a great reminder. Just because a horse is having a problem or a horse has had a couple mishaps in his past, we see both of the horses that we've worked with, the stud, Logan, he was a horse that was very well trained, had a bunch of time in him, but anytime that he got to be in study, he would just lose his mind and forget that he was a trained horse. He would start yelling and running backwards and just a lot of shenanigans. <laughs> He was a horse that was well trained, but he had put a couple people on the ground, had a couple reactions that people weren't able to hold on to, and the same thing. There we go, that's what I'm looking for right there. Notice, if the horse stops immediately when I stop, I don't just jump into their face and back them up. I pause, then I back them up. I jump into their grill if they take an extra step or lean in on me like that. Because if they take another step after I stop, they're either not paying attention or they're not respecting. And we were able to apply a few methods to make him calm and quiet again. 
I want you to think about the four or five people in your life that you really respect. And there's four or five because we, we respect very few people in this life. Now I want you to think, how many of those four or five people didn't give you a reason to respect them? Zero. Because respect is, in this life it isn't given, it's earned. So we have to do what it takes to earn his respect. The fact that he's looking over there when I have his face in my hands tells me he doesn't respect me, which is okay. He just got, he just got to the class. But we are gonna change that and we're gonna give him a reason to respect us. And we're gonna start right here in kindergarten. So you see on both of these horses that they have good horsemanship. You know that they're putting the work on. But when it comes to, to building that attention muscle, you have to give them a reason to be attentive to you. Uh, he likes girls too much. <laughs> Okay. And he has a hard time paying attention. He actually rides pretty decent when he's got his brain on uh, me. And um, I would like to be able to go to a public area and do a competition or whatever, or do endurance riding and not have a screaming happy stallion all the time. I don't know, we found you on Facebook or something like that. So we've been watching your live feed stuff yeah. and your different classes you've been doing on Facebook. And it's been really helpful. And uh, so we're really excited to be here and see what else we can learn. You can get the same obedience with a flat collar, a choke collar, a spike collar, uh, or an electric collar. But why do some of the most finished trainers have the electric collar? Because they're looking for that finished look. They're using a finished method. People ask me, oh, do you wear spurs? Very rarely. And if I do, it's for finishing. It's to get that finished, finished look that I'm looking for, that I don't have to move my leg, that I really don't have to wrap my leg around the horse to get what I want. It's very, very minute. Spurs, crop, whip, stick, all these things are to add pressure as an aid. But most of the time, you don't need them if you have better control of the horse's head. The horse that's being lazy, if you have good control of their head, they don't act lazy. The horse that's super hot, if you have good control of their head, they don't act super hot. If you have the horse that, that's not bending, not giving, not side passing, you can't control their head, all of a sudden they're side passing, they're bending, they're pivoting, they're doing whatever you want. You have to control the head to control the horse. So it's the same thing. The reason I can do this with him is he gives his head better than the, than the younger one. Now that I have his face, I use the same hand that I have his face with, the shoulder. Notice I don't want him to stop going forward. I need that forward momentum. Again, that time I didn't even touch his shoulder. My thumb got close to his shoulder and he moved over. Okay, rib. So whenever I do the rib, I use my push hand, my back hand. I lock my elbow into my side here. I touch him. See him rib over right there. That time I didn't touch his ribs. Hindquarters. Very nice, very nice. So what I'm saying is <laughs> that's not accepted in class. I wasn't allowed to chase girls in class, so he's not allowed to yell for girls in class. What I'm saying, obviously we're not gonna go get a, a, a spike collar or anything for this horse, but we're gonna be more abrupt. We're gonna be a little bit less predictable. And this unpredictability is gonna give him a reason to pay attention to us. Everything that you're training to a horse, it always starts abrupt. It always starts flagrantly. Ah. And then in time, it gets finer and finer. I'm working on this attention muscle today. So in the beginning, it's gonna be everything very exaggerated. He's never gonna know when I'm gonna turn into the Tasmanian devil. So he's gonna have to start paying attention to me. Now that I know he respects me, we're gonna move to first grade. First grade is where we really get that undivided attention and we give him a reason to pay attention to us. Cole's in the lead hand. See him just crouching in. That tells you everything you need to know right there. When you see horses with bite marks, they're betas. It's that simple. Buddies, they buddy up, they get close to each other, they're always laying on each other, they're always messing with each other. The alpha's always spotless. You can tell who was throwing bites and who was receiving them just by looking at their coats. 
So whenever they're trying to buddy up to you, I don't care if you feed your horse cookies out of your mouth, that's fine, but it has to be on your terms. It's okay if you pet them, if you hug them, if you roll them over and scratch their belly on your turn. It's not okay for him to encroach me on his because he's wanting to. Anybody ever wonder why everything Western has poppers on it? Well, it's not for looks, okay? <laughs> Fringe went out in the 80s. It's for a reason. When I point him off, he's 10 years old. Y'all are good trainers. He shouldn't be disrespectful enough to look around at everything, okay? They know the right thing to do and he's still not paying attention. This is one thing that I want you to raise in your standards. You can't have the same patience with a toddler that you have with a teenager, right? All right, think, think about that again. You can't have the same patience with a teenager as you do a toddler. If you do, with a toddler, you say, oh, it's, it's okay, you don't know no better, it's fine, it's okay, oh, you did. If you do that with a teenager, they end up knocking over a liquor store, okay? They end up going to juvie. They end up getting kicked out of school. You have to have a short fuse because you've already taught them right from wrong. This is a trained horse, okay? You can tell just by looking at him, just by the way that he, he reacts to my pressure, he's trained, y'all put time into him. So, I'm gonna start being very short with him. I ask him nicely once, I give him one warning, and then he's catching fire. That's gonna demand his respect, and in turn, is gonna demand his undivided attention, because he's not gonna wanna miss my cues whenever I'm giving him my cues. And all of a sudden, the horse has a reason to give me this. Yes, sir. What can I do for you, sir? Very nice. Notice how I can manipulate his body better than the mare by pressuring here and holding here. I can pressure the shoulder and hold the face and he gives me his face and moves his head at the same time. If he could do it out of the saddle, he could do it in the saddle. This is why this is the, the most popular method that I teach because it, it doesn't take a lot of athleticism, doesn't take a lot of movement and look at the bend that I have with it. The average horse is gonna give to it. Wait till he turns around. You watch my thumb move his shoulder. Just by adding a few methods and techniques that the owners haven't heard of before, we were really able to make a difference in him. One more time. There we go. Shoulder over. Keep that horse moving forward. Grab his face. Okay, perfect. Now, keep his, grab his face. Just ribbed him over. One more time. Just hind quarters. Once you have that horse's face loose, it doesn't matter how strong, how big, how tough they are. If you have them like a bobblehead here, you'll be able to reach over with your thumb and push. Well, once he knows that I'm going to make his shoulder uncomfortable and he's going to give, well, then I get the shoulder over. I get the rib over. I get the hind quarters to disengage. Right? Well, if I could do that just by pointing at it with a finger, you know how easy it's gonna be in the saddle to get the same thing? If you can get your horse and you can point at different body parts and move individual body parts, all these little problems are gonna disappear. Getting on the horse, getting off the horse, horse spooking, the horse getting too hot, the horse getting too cold, the horse getting lazy, the horse bucking. All these issues are gonna leave you. Michael, you can't touch a horse in the face. They'll forever be head shot. You'll never be able to touch their ears again. Pressure is pressure. They get kicked in the face. They still don't run from every horse that they see. Okay, just like us, as long as, they, as, long as you catch them in the moment so they can start learning right from wrong, you're not gonna have a problem. Does that make sense? Whenever I reach up and I bop a horse like this, or uh, I pop a horse uh, in the ear with a, a lead rope that goes over their head or, or is aimed improperly, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't crush their soul. They're not forever mentally scarred, right? You need to pressure in the moment that things are happening. If you don't like a habit, whatever habit it is that you don't like, you don't like your horse pooping over here by the water bowl. If every time he lifts his tail by the water bowl, you put some kind of pressure, and when he moves to the other side of the stall, you put a release, very soon he's gonna poop over there on the other side of the stall. Now I'm gonna get in the saddle, and I'm gonna expect to have the exact same horse, and I'm not gonna give him any slack. He shows me that he's trained. He shows me that he can give. So if he's not, it's not because he doesn't know, it's because he's not respecting me. So, 
as well controlled as this head was from the ground, I'm gonna look for the exact same thing in the saddle. Notice on the two with the yelling. Yelling and head going up is synonymous. Okay, yelling and attention. Head goes up, attention goes somewhere else, their head goes up. Everything that's not what we want, their head goes up. So our ability in those moments of adversity, put your head down. That's our ability to control the situation. That's our ability to be able to take a horse that's excited and say, excuse me, I need your face. Oh, I don't know why the reiners, they, they, they flex so much. Well, the reason that they want their horses so flexible is because they want it to gain unequivocally the horse's attention. Yeah. Awesome. So you guys have a breeding facility, right? Yes. Where are you located out of? Uh, Mason, Wisconsin, which is just under Lake Superior, the top okay. of Wisconsin, almost in Canada. So Okay, awesome. Yeah. And, and the name of your ranch? The Sunrise Ranch. Okay, so. perfect. And you all do training? Um, I've been training and my husband with me as he has time for, for years doing family friendly horses. Um, we have five kids and we raise Scottish Highlands so we do a lot of cattle work and trail riding. I love endurance myself. Um, but we fell in love with the Morgan breed Yes. and so we have uh, a growing band of uh, brood mares that we're really happy about, really excited about. We're really excited about the full crop. This is our second year getting a good full crop and um, just the breed in general is such a versatile breed. Absolutely. Anytime he gives me problems, I'm gonna do what I have to, to to make sure that his head is with me. So right there. So I want you guys to notice, not because they're the same breed and the same gender, but because they have the same conditioning from the same trainers, I'm able to, to fast forward and work on more advanced stuff on both of these horses that a lot of the other horses I won't be able to work on. Does everybody see that? How horses are a result, just like children, of their conditioning? It's not the breed, it's not the, the age, the size. You can find some 10-year-old stallions that are absolute nuts. This one's not, this one's here with me. What am I working on here? That I couldn't walk him straight with and pull him. I could pull him to the left. When I pulled him to the right, he would lock up. Um, not necessarily try to take his head away from me, but his feet would lock up. So I want the ability. You see him running to the fence there because he didn't want to give. There we go. So I don't know if anybody here is familiar with dressage. Oh. Nice, nice. And dressage, you live, I mean, with a hip in or a hip out. They, they take the horses and it's not just control of the head, they want control of every body part that the horse has. So the horse has five controllable body parts, head, neck, shoulders, ribs, hindquarters. So in dressage, a little bit less flexing, a lot more moving the hindquarters. So they'll go hip in. It's called three tracking. What, what that means is the horse is crooked just enough that the front left and the right back are making the same track line in the sand. And then the front right is out by itself and the left back is out by itself. It's called three tracking. Fancy. Okay, I got you. The reason that that's important is because the back end controls the leads and the, as you can control those hips as you want, then you're able to catch whatever lead you want. We were able to add our education and our experience to the situation and show the owners a better way. And all of a sudden, they feel very confident that they're gonna be able to have a good time on the horse and ride them and be able to be safe on the horse. Pay attention. Pay attention. So what did you think about the clinic today? It was awesome. We had a lot of fun and we've been looking forward to this for a long time. And so 
watching you on uh, the internet, um, Isaac and I knew we wanted to come and um, see what you could teach us about working with our stallions because we've been training horses for a long time, but we were running into some things we didn't know and we really got some answers this week and so we're really excited to go home and try them out and make some improvements. So what was your favorite part of the clinic today? Oh, definitely seeing you ride our horses. Oh. <laughs> and um, I don't, yeah, watching uh, you ride them and seeing what you brought out of them and seeing how you dealt with it, for sure. And then it was good to get to ride them too, but um, on the spot, I don't think as well. So um, seeing you ride them and then being able to take those videos and go home and review that with my husband, because it's really cool that he has a stallion, I have a stallion, and we can help each other to remember and refresh on what we learned here. I think that you have a good understanding of the mind of the horse. You're not afraid to treat a horse like a horse would treat a horse. And that's really important. Um, and it makes sense to the horse and so it brings out good results. And that's what I see. Well, I just really love both of your stallions. I could tell that you have very good training in them. And then, so for like Logan, he was your older breeding stallion, the 10 year old. And he had the ability that he was trained as long as things were calm and quiet. But then whenever he saw the mares or he got excited, whenever he started yelling, then he would get resistance in his head and that would pretty much take away the steering wheel from you. Did you have any aha moments whenever you saw the way we worked with him? Yeah, um, I basically didn't know what to do um, when he acted up like that. And since I want to do cowboy dressage and I want to do endurance and I have to have him mannerly, um, he was throwing himself into a reverse really fast and just not listening um, and so I came away learning not to get more excited but to have a plan of bending him and getting him moving forward with his neck really well bent and um, to get him really uh, soft and flexible um, in the neck and the head control so I guess that's the biggest thing I came away with and um, the same thing with the transitions getting that head properly in hand and Absolutely, control yeah. the head, control yeah. the horse, guy. Yeah. And it was beautiful see, to see her and her husband's uh, stallions. They were just absolutely gorgeous. Both of them well-rounded, beautiful mane and tails, and, and just good-looking horses, and they had a nice temperament. So we did have a little bit. Anytime that you have a breeding stallion, you'll want to make sure that you can manage their emotions. So he, he was a very well-trained horse. He's done a great job with him. And anytime that he would get excited, then he would start to get a little bit too excited. Those RPMs would go up, and we wouldn't be able to control him. And once we got that done, we were able to take him out of the round pen and we were able to ride out here with the brood mares. We were able to ride around the other people in the parking lot where all the horses were. And I was very happy about how you were able to control him mm -hmm. and how you were able to, nope, be quiet, put your head down. So we just changed a couple uh, things to our approach and made sure that we gained control of his head and made sure that we bent him and got, got his attention back to us and away from the, the mares. Yeah. And it's pretty amazing, especially for the folks out there. Whenever you have this stud that's being so study and yelling, notice that their head is always popping up. Anytime the horse gets excited, whether they want to whether they want to run away or get excited or buck or do whatever, the only three things that they can do from the saddle is buck, run, and rear. All three things, they have to have their head locked out and centered. Mm -hmm. So whenever he would get excited, he would start backing up on you and locking his head up. Mm -hmm. As soon as you were able to bend him to the left and right, it gave you the control. Once yep. you do that for another week or two, you're going to be ready to go out there and, and yeah. compete or, or go to an endurance race, and I think you'll handle them nicely. We're real excited, so thank you. Very thank much. you very much. I sure appreciate that. <laughs> you have to remember, knowledge is power. So if you're having a problem with your horse, don't condemn them. Give them the opportunity to be around somebody that has a little bit more experience, a little bit more education, and maybe they can help your horse become the perfect horse.